that we are happy to um, talk to you today about celebrating World Soil Day. Uh, World Soil Day is kind of a mostly forgotten holiday, I believe. A lot of people don't think about it. Uh, we call it dirt and we walk over it every day, but we don't really think that much about it. Um, so we want to really recognize the importance of soil and um, remember that without a good healthy soil, we don't have a good healthy life. It's a basic building block. And so we're gonna really explore that a little bit more today. Are dirt and soil the same thing? I mentioned that we walk over it every day and we call it dirt. Is it the same thing? Yes, no, or I really don't know. It's maybe even something you hadn't really even thought about before, uh, but we'll talk about it. So uh, we just wanna kind of get your opinion. Are they the same thing or are they different? But I want you to take a look between these two and I'm gonna call them both soils. Uh, but I want you to really notice the things that are the same and things that are different and just kind of think about that. Um, you will should hopefully be able to notice, obviously, a color difference. That should be the first thing that everyone sees. But also notice component differences. Notice if there's things that are, look different. This one, for example, um, you can see some twigs in here, some pieces of mulch. Um, there's different um, little dried up leaves. There's an acorn shell in here. So not only is the color darker, there's also some different components in here. Um, and it's a moisture. If you were able to touch this, um, you would see that it was moisture. You don't see a lot of dust when I do this with it. That's very different from this one, which is dry, grainy. You can see parts and pieces of rocks in here. And when I do this, you can definitely see a dust cloud um, behind. Um, so these are some differences in the soils. Soil's not all the same, and that's really something that we wanna talk about today. And different types of soil are different type, good for different types of things. You'll hear me say that a lot today as well. But we need to go to the basics, just the beginning of where soil comes from. And the basic at the beginning of soil is, it really comes from rocks. And we call the process weathering, where those rocks, when they hit together, those rocks break up heart um, from that force. And it can be caused because of um, water or ice. It can be caused because of shifting in the earth. It can be caused just by force. And um, watch and notice as I hit these rocks together, you might be able to see some dust coming off from them. I'm gonna tell you that's soil. And so as you look at this um, paper, this was um, blank, blank black paper, hard to say, um, before I started. And now you can see there's a lot of dust on it. You'll also notice that there's different sizes of chunks. There's a pretty good sized chunk floating over here. There's smaller ones over here. If I rub my finger on it, you can almost see my fingerprint. Um, and when I rub it together, it's super, super smooth. That's when the different sizes of those particles as they broke off. So that's the basis or the beginning of soil. Um, and if you look behind me, you'll notice that I have this profile of soil. Um, and you'll, again, you'll notice the color differences. So this top layer of soil, which we magically call topsoil. I love it when science words make sense. That top layer of soil is called topsoil. You'll notice how dark it is. That was the black container that I held up it really has all those leaves that are falling off the trees in the fall. They're landing on the ground. Um, they're decomposing or rotting and becoming part of the soil. We have our lovely earthworms that help with that. We have roly polies that can help with that. And we even have millipedes that can help with that. So we have a lot going on underground. Um, all in that top layer of soil. And that's really where that dark color comes from. That really dark color is um, all those nutrients that are breaking down from those dead and decaying leaves. Think about a banana peel that's been around a little too long. I'm sure you've seen that lovely black and slimy color and texture of your rotting banana before. Um, if it's been around a little too long. That's what you're seeing, that rotting plant material gives it that really dark, moist color and texture, which is really awesome. Another thing that we add when we talk about the soil, of course, is the rainwater. Uh, we have that water that gets down into the soil and it's super important for the roots to have. Um, and it's a great component or part of the soil. Another ingredient in the soil that we really don't think about um, is air. And we need to have that air in the soil because um, the worms need to have that air. Um, and the plants need to have that air. We just need that 
spacing and so forth in there. So those are the components of the soil. And again, a lot is happening in that top layer, that top soil. Underneath that top layer of soil, we have what we call subsoil. Sub means under. It's under the top soil, which is of course on top. That subsoil is lighter in color, not nearly as much happening here. Roots can still grow down through it, but it's a lot harder to start plants here than it would be in the topsoil. Then if you go even deeper down, digging um, below, then you'll come to what we call the parent material layer. This layer, you start to see some pieces of rocks in here um, and they're broken up from that bottom layer. And the parent material layer here is where those pieces of rocks are gonna to start to hit next to each other, that weathering that I showed you with the rocks hitting next to each other and forming our soil. That's gonna happen in this layer. And then if we can go deep enough, dig down, down, down into the soil, we have bedrock. Bedrock is that bottom rock. It's down as far as you can dig, you hit rock bottom. I always say that bedrock is a lot um, like, you know, we lay on our bed, it's the support system for the soil, which is to me, that's where the name comes from. Um, so those are the layers of the soil and the components of the soil. I am gonna share a PowerPoint that kind of puts this all together and maybe gives you a little bit more um, information about these different soils. So I'm gonna share screen. There we go. So hopefully you can all see the PowerPoint now. Um, again, we are celebrating World Soil Day um, with the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and the theme this year, they have kind of a different theme all revolving around soil. The theme this year is keep soil alive and protect soil biodiversity. And so we're gonna really talk about that um, a little bit later on in the program, but we wanted to start with soil basics. So we asked the question, is this soil or is this dirt? Um, and you guys did a really good job of noted, noting that there was probably some kind of a difference between the two. And I'm guessing that most of you would agree that this is soil. It's a good, healthy soil. Um, there's a lot of things you can see in it, like little pieces of leaves, um, the mulch maybe, it's that darker color, it has that organic matter that we talked about. Um, the soil composition, again, is those four basic things we talked about. 45% is rocks and minerals. So 45% of all of our soil is actually that weathered rock um, that I showed you. Only 5% is organic matter and it's only 5% because it's only in the topsoil, um, which you look at the soil as a whole, that's just a little bit of the soil. Then 25% water and 25% air. My guess is right now we've got more water and less air. It's uh, rained and then it snowed and then the snow melted. Um, and so we've got a lot of water in the soil right now and probably a little bit less air. If we were doing this in the middle of the summer when it's kind of hot and kind of dry, you'll have more air and less water in the soil. They share their 50% really well. So we did that weathering and um, talked about that. If you couldn't see it really clearly, here's a video of the same process. You can really watch that soil grading off those rocks and adding to um, that paper there. So this is your basis or beginning of soil. And again, larger pieces in some places, smaller pieces have broken off as well. That grading of the soil really starts that basis or beginning of our soil types. And is also part of where that color comes from. So if you look at soil colors, notice they're not all the same. Um, even in different parts of our state, you will have different soil colors. Um, and those colors, um, a good part of that actually comes from the um, type of rocks or minerals that those soils are made from. So this is a project that a third grade class did a number of years ago where they wrote to the Department of Natural Resources in every um, state in, the, in our country and got soil samples back. Um, so you can see we've got a really white soils in some places, especially that sandy soil, like you can think of the beaches in Florida. Um, that's a lighter color. Then we have some of our oranges over on the East Coast and also in the Southwest. Um, those are probably from iron ores. Um, the iron is an orangey soil. Um, we have actually a color chart. It's called the Munsell Soil Chart, um, which is the soil Bible for um, people that 
are working with the soils and they really tell us a lot about those different colors in the soils. Um, and again, those different colors you can see here, you can see different names, pyrite, um, calcite, quartz. Those are different minerals, rocks and minerals that are forming our soils. And so they're gonna form those different colors. Another um, thing that the color chart also shows us is how wet that soil is, because water is also going to make a difference in the color of the soil. Um, so we can tell our wetland soils because they're a different color than soils that are mostly dry. I mentioned as the soils broke apart, they broke apart in different size grains. That's um, the type of soil we have, the texture of the soil. And those textures are really important because different textures of soil are important for different types of things. So we have the rough grainy, think when you rub your fingers together, um, rub a soil between your fingers. If it feels really like um, sugar or salt, then you have a grainy soil, that's a sandy soil. Um, and so we have that happening. Um, you can think about making a sand castle on the beach or in a sandbox. Remember what happens to it when it rains that water hits that soil, that sand castle, and it breaks it apart because those sand grains are so big. Notice the big yellow dot here on the screen. That's magnified, obviously, but that's under a microscope. But those grains, because of their sizes and their shape, they can't pack really tightly together. Water goes in between them really quickly, bumps those grains out of the way, and it ruins your sand castle. The middle type of soil, the green dot that you see here, is called a silty soil. That's probably what you have in your backyard. That's what we want to have for our gardens. It's the in-between one, a little bit smaller, so they pack together a little bit better. There's a good support system there for the plants, but still enough room for that water to get through. Then we have a clay soil. You've probably worked with clay in art class or Play-Doh at home. Um, clay makes pottery and things like that because it sticks really well together. This little dot that you see here, again, that's magnified. You cannot see a grain of clay with your own eyes. You have to use a microscope to see it. They're so tiny and they pack so tightly together. If you could remember or think about making a project out of clay, if somebody accidentally pours a little bit of water on it, it gets kind of sticky, kind of soft and smushy, but it doesn't fall apart like your sandcastle did because those clay grains stick so well together. And we think about clay for liners of ponds, um, for making bricks, you know, different things like that because of the um, size and the grains and the particle of the clay. If you have a mix of all three of these together, that's called a loam soil. And that's what we have the most of. We have a lot of loamy soils. And they, name or, and they talk about the loam depending on um, you know, what the components are. So it could be a sandy silt loam. It could be a clay silt loam. It could be a silt clay loam. Whichever one is mentioned first is the one that there's the most of. And then we have the mix from there. So those are our different soil types that we have. And again, different types or textures, it's the feel of the soil. We mentioned the layers and um, I often get the question, well, how deep is it to subsoil or how deep it is, is it to parent material um, and to bedrock? And that really, really depends on where you are. And for those of you who are familiar with Olentangy Indian Caverns, which are in the um, Southern part of Delaware County, just above Franklin County where we live, um, the Indian caverns, you're walking in bedrock. You're walking in the rocks that are formed there. Um, so your bedrock is right up at the surface at that point. Um, different locations within our county and our state, you could go 100, 200, even 300 feet before you hit bedrock. It really depends on where you are. Um, so a typical um, that you see here, that O horizon, horizon is a fancy word for layer. The O horizon could be just a couple of inches. It's the leaf litter that humus, the dead plant materials that lands on the ground. The topsoil, 10 inches would be a lovely topsoil, a good rich topsoil, um, possibly 12 inches in the woods um, because we get to get a, a lot more leaf litter there in your yard, six, eight, maybe 10 inches if you have a good healthy topsoil, it depends. Um, and then deeper for the subsoil here, it says 30 inches. Again, could go much deeper than that depending but you start to see that color difference. You start to see little pieces of rocks in there. The white container that I held up at the very beginning was a subsoil, um, gritty, grainy, not nearly as moist and things like that. Then you get down to your parent material layer. Here it says 48 inches. Again, it could be much deeper. It could be 100, to 100 feet before you got to, you know, into the parent material or through the parent material, depending on your location. 
bedrock is underneath that, again, the support system for all of our soil. We think about soil as being important for our daily life. Our um, soil is super important because it grows our trees, which give us oxygen, which give us food, um, all of our plant material and things like that. We also look at soil as a complete habitat, just like you see different habitats here. Um, the soil is a complete habitat. It has the food, water, shelter, air, and space that all animals have to have in order to survive. I mentioned it's you know half air and water, um, has the different food sources. There's a lot of soil, so there's a lot of space in it and it's underground, so it's protected. We're gonna look at that soil as a habitat at this point. So I am gonna stop sharing my screen and let um, my partner, uh, Miss Amy, take it over from here. All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We're so excited to have so many people here celebrating World Soil Day. So just like Miss Pettit was sharing, um, we, we know that there is a, a lot to learn about soil and we certainly know that soil is a really important habitat for a lot of different organisms. So I can't see everybody right now, but I'm guessing that most people at some point or another have gone outside, turned over a rock, maybe flipped over a log, maybe dug through some leaf litter, and you've probably found some of the soil organisms that use soil as a habitat. So anybody want to throw into the chat box what you might find in soil, what types of organisms are using soil as a habitat? Go ahead and throw some ideas in the chat box there. Ants, excellent. Very good. We're absolutely worms. We're going to hopefully find some worms today in our soil sample. Worms, very good. Ants, worms, great. Roly polies, yeah, absolutely. So roly polies are one of our favorites. We're definitely going to see roly polies today centipedes, excellent, beetles, ants, worms, very good, very good. We have a whole container filled with different soil organisms. Now at first glance, first thing we're seeing is a roly-poly that's making its way across one of the leaves that is on the surface of this soil, okay? So since this is a container where we have a lot of different living organisms, and since this is a habitat, we need to make sure that we have enough food in here for all of our living organisms. For our animals that are decomposers, which means that they take living material and they break it down, okay, we need to have things like leaves in here that have fallen off of the trees. And that's gonna be a really important food source for our decomposers. So I'm gonna pull some of these off. We can see, I put these in last night. We can see that there's been some activity. Ooh, in less than 24 hours, we've had uh, some activity on these leaves. In fact, you can see some of it right here. This is an area right here where some of our soil organisms have maybe consumed some of the leaf litter that's in here and they've gone to the bathroom. And you're actually seeing where they're starting to incorporate some of that organic matter back into the soil. Okay, so let's keep pulling this out. We'll take a look and see, ah, uh, there we go. Okay, so now we're getting down to some of this rich, healthy topsoil you can see that there's quite a lot happening. So right under this leaf right here, let me see if I can pull it back. We have one of our soil critters right down in the corner down here, okay? That's called a centipede. So these ones are not decomposers. These are not an organism that is one of our decomposers. These guys are actually active predators. And I'm gonna see if I can um, get it in just a second and put it in a container so we can take a little bit of a closer look. We also have in here, oh, this is a cool one. See if I can get this one into a container for you all to take a quick look at. Looks like it was maybe feeding on this leaf right here. Oh, I caught a couple of different things in here. All right, so let me get this a little bit closer. Hold my hand still so you all can see it. All right, so in this soil container, we have several different organisms. A couple of them are rolled up. You all told us what those are. You all mentioned that those are roly polies. So we can see that our roly polies which one of them is right here. It's rolled up in a ball. So that's one of their strategies for survival. So roly polies have an exoskeleton, which is a hard outer shell. They can roll up into that ball and, and use their exoskeleton as a way to protect the soft part of their bodies underneath. When they're no longer feeling threatened, they'll uncurl from that ball and they'll kind of cruise along their way, just like you're seeing those other two roly polies in here doing. 
these guys are roly polies, they are decomposers. So they serve a really important role in the soil habitat, which is they're gonna take that leaf litter, that organic matter that falls to the ground, they're gonna consume that. Again, they're gonna go to the bathroom and they're gonna add that, those important, important nutrients into the soil and make that available for our plants that are growing in the soil. Now we have another organism in here that also looks a little different from our roly polies. If you can, count how many legs you think are on that animal. So that is, we're looking at this one right here. Go ahead and type in the chat box. And Miss Pitta, I don't have the chat box open at the moment. So you might have to tell me what some of the answers are that we're getting. Okay. Um, I saw 28, six, six to eight, 154. Woo, that was a lot of legs. 15, 12. Lots of guesses. Lots of guesses. Well, those of you that guessed six, you're correct. So what we know about organisms that have six legs is that they're an insect. It does look like this animal maybe has more than six. It has a really long abdomen. Um, sorry, let me just get my pencil in the right way. It has a really long abdomen up there. But right up here, we can see that it has um, three uh, pairs of legs. So we have six total legs and that tells us that it belongs to the insect family. Now this beetle that we have up here, this is actually a rove beetle, but it's not in its adult form yet. So if this one were an adult, it would have wings. So it's in its juvenile stage here in our soil ecosystem, which is cool because we do have some animals that live in here, but they live in here in their different life stages. Okay, so we'll put that one off to the side. Let's go back to that centipede because I still see one right down here. Let's see if I can catch it without um, hurting it. It's fast. Hopefully you guys can see just how fast our centipedes are. This is probably one we've used for programs before. He seems to know that I'm trying to put him <laughs> up here. It doesn't even- He's become to wise to you. Yeah, he's gotten wise to me. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look at that. Oh yeah, look at how cool that animal is. All right, so I think I heard um, some people earlier mention that you can find centipedes in our soil habitat and this is one of those centipedes. So this is a soil centipede, okay? You can see that they have quite a lot of legs and these guys move very, very quickly. So one of the reasons that they have to move quickly is because they are an active predator. So these are actually, these animals are capturing other animals and consuming them for their source of food. So centipedes have a venom that they can inject into their prey so that they can slow them down. And that's different from one of our soil organisms that looks kind of similar to them, which is the millipede. So millipedes are very different from our centipedes, even though they're, they're um, similar and they're somewhat related to each other. So let me pour this out and let's see if I can actually find one of our millipedes in our soil sample here so that we can do a little bit of a comparison between our centipedes and our millipedes. Oh, here's a worm. I think we had some people mention worms earlier. Here's one of our soil superheroes right here. You guys can see them moving along. Here's our millipede. Let me get this one out so you guys can take a little bit of a comparison here between the two. All right. So here's our millipede. And here's our centipede. They both have a lot of legs. They both have long bodies. They both have antennas, which you'll see in just a moment when this millipede uncurls itself. However, their behavior is very different and it does have to do with the food that they eat and their role in the environment. Okay, so just like we said, our centipede is an active predator. It has a venom that it can capture its prey. Millipedes don't have that. So our millipedes, which is the one that's right here that's curled up, these guys are decomposers. They're also gonna take that leaf litter. They're gonna consume it, break it down and add those nutrients back into the soil. They also don't have a venom that they can use for protection. So these guys are doing, um, this one in particular is doing one of the things that it does to protect itself, which is that it can curl up similar to a kind of like a roly poly. And again, it can protect its soft body underneath and just expose its exoskeleton. Now millipedes are also super cool. They have another way of protecting themselves. So if you guys could um, smell through this iPad, you might notice that millipedes can kind of let off a stinky scent. It's one of the ways that they can protect themselves. So if you're a predator going after a millipede, 
And as you're kind of um, moving that millipede around, if you smell something stinky, that millipede might not be as appetizing anymore. You might decide that you're gonna choose a different animal for a meal. So it's another way that they protect themselves. Just like our roly polies, we consider, even though all of our soil organisms are important, we kind of consider our millipedes another one of our soil superheroes because they do that really important job of breaking down organic matter and incorporating it into the soil. So put those two off to the side. Let's see what else we can find in here. We talked about roly polies. Um, if you have ever been searching under um, a log or in the soil before, you've probably seen a lot of roly polies. And sometimes we even see organisms that look similar to roly polies, but they're in fact a different species. And that's this one right here. So um, this one, as at first glance, you think, oh, it does, it looks like a roly poly. It's definitely a roly poly. These guys are actually an animal that we call a sow bug. They're similar to roly polies, but they have some physical characteristics that make them a little bit different. Okay, their own species. The first thing that you may notice is that first, well, first of all, you see their long antenna in the front. On the opposite side of their body, you might see that there's two short little tails that are sticking out their back end. Okay, sow bugs have those two little tails. Roly polies don't have those. The other thing that you may notice about this sow bug, or at least you would be able to if you were doing a side-by-side -side comparison, is if you compare them to roly polies, sow bugs' bodies are a little bit flatter. They're not quite as rounded. And sow bugs can't curl themselves up into a tight ball like roly polies do. So their behavior is a little bit different as well as far as what their bodies are capable of doing. They serve the same important role as our roly polies. So they're also decomposers breaking down that organic matter. So these guys are also considered to be one of our soil superheroes. Now, just as a side note about um, our sow bugs and our roly polies, they're pretty cool because a lot of people think they're insects, but they're actually a land crustacean. They're more closely related to crabs and shrimp than they are to insects. So it's pretty cool that we have these guys up on land. We also have a similar aquatic version um, that you can find in rivers and streams. But again, they're, they're um, a species that is found in water and these ones are terrestrial. They're found up on land. All right, for the sake of time and also so that we don't give away all of our soil um, critters that you might find when you're out and exploring soil, we're gonna show you one more, which is one of my personal favorites here. So let me see if I can get my hand just close enough and the light, you know what, I'm gonna have to move it, I think, into a white container, Miss Pettit, so you all can see it a little bit better. Sounds good. All right, let's take a look at that one. Yes. The light a little bit, is that a little bit better? Oh, and it's starting to come back out again. All right, so this is, one of our land snails that we have. And a lot of times you will find snails in a soil habitat. You also find slugs, which again is a different species, but closely related to snails. One of the big differences is, is that slugs do not produce a shell, snails do. So they have a special organ inside of their body that allows them to produce a shell that they um, will, that will grow with them their entire lives. So if you ever find a snail shell and the snail is no longer inside of it, it means that snail has completed its life cycle. It is no longer alive. Now snails are basically um, walking along there on one giant foot. And on the front side of their body, they also have a mouth, which is pretty cool. It's almost like a tongue with teeth. They're really good at scraping and shredding things. So this snail will cruise along in its soil habitat and it's really gonna look for whatever it can find. Sometimes that's plant material. Sometimes they'll also eat um, uh, other animal material and they use that tongue. It's called a radula to kind of scrape and um, consume their food. I think one of the things that makes them so, I mean, look at how adorable it is. Come on, right? It's adorable. <laughs> one of the things that makes it so adorable is those eyes that are on those eye stalks. So those two long pointy projections that you see at the front of the snail, those are its eye stalks. Underneath it also has little tentacles that it kind of uses um, for feeling and uh, kind of making sense or understanding the environment that it's in. So another very cool um, soil critter that we have. 
I mean, we could keep going with this all day long. I feel like there's so many amazing things to see in soil, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna stop sharing here real quick and I'm gonna jump back over to the PowerPoint to, um, to kind of wrap up this presentation here. So just like we talked about, um, a lot of our uh, soil organisms have very special physical and behavioral adaptations that allow them to survive in this very unique soil habitat. Okay, so we talked about exoskeletons that a lot of them have, how they can use their exoskeleton. Um, incidentally, in order for these organisms to grow larger, if they have an exoskeleton, they have to molt that exoskeleton. So this is a pretty neat picture of, um, uh, I think this one is a roly poly, that's actually mid molt. So you can see half of its body, half of its old exoskeleton has been shed the front of its body is still yet to shed here. And a lot of times when you have, an, when you have animals that have an exoskeleton, um, when they first molt, that new exoskeleton will be a little bit softer and it allows a little bit of stretch before it hardens up. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that our organisms are gonna survive in this soil habitat. We didn't talk a lot about salamanders because we were talking about invertebrates today as, a, uh, as organisms in our soil habitat. But especially during this time of the year, we have a lot of different organisms that will also use soil as a way to survive through our cold winter months. So salamanders are a great example of that. This is a picture where we have a salamander um, this way. This is this salamander's tail. And we have another salamander here, and this is its tail coming out. And they're using the soil. This was the side of the log that was pressed up against the soil um, to survive through the cold winter months. So some really, really cool physical and behavioral adaptations. And then just to kind of give you a visual of how important our soil decomposers are um, in this soil habitat, these were leaves that um, we took photographs of over the course of one week. So this is the first day that we added those leaves in, okay? By, let's see, I think I have, by the next, uh, by Friday of that week, this is what had happened to those leaves. Um, I removed this one so you could see what was happening underneath. This leaf was whole at the beginning of the week. So on Tuesday, this whole leaf was entire. This was an entire leaf that our soil decomposers have already broken down. This is the following Monday. Again, this is the removal with that tulip poplar leaf. And look, you can see the soil critters that are on there breaking it down. And then by the following Tuesday, this is what those leaves looked like. So in just a week, look at how much of that organic matter our soil organisms have broken down and incorporated into the soil. They're pretty amazing. It's also important to remember that even though these soil organisms are really small, they serve an important role in helping to make connections to all the other animals that are within that food web. So this is an example of just a few of the animals that we would find here in our own backyards here in central Ohio. And some of them we recognize as soil organisms. Some of them we recognize as living in other places and terrestrial habitats. All of them are related to each other. And we think it's really important to mention that you wouldn't have robins, you wouldn't have coyotes, you wouldn't have vultures, you wouldn't have crows if you didn't have these soil organisms kind of at the most basic level, helping to create a very healthy soil. Okay, so we know that soil is really important for our soil organisms that live in it. We also know that without those soil organisms, we're not gonna have healthy soil to grow our healthy plants. If we don't have our healthy plants, we're not gonna have the food resources that we need to survive, and we're not gonna have the oxygen that we need to survive. So it's really, really important that we have those healthy soils that are created in part because of those soil organisms. In addition to that, Ms. Pettit mentioned this, soil gives us a lot of different resources. So we produce bricks, we produce cement blocks, we produce a lot of the um, vessels that we use for eating and drinking, like our plates and our bowls. And we even can produce glass from different types of soils. So on even a more personal level with regards to just us, soil is really, really important. Now, if all of this is of interest to you, if you guys are really excited about soil superheroes and soil, we have created some resources for you so that you can go out into the field and take a look at these different soil organisms. For those of you that registered for, um, this, uh, for, for this Zoom, 
after the meeting, we're gonna share with you a recording. We will also share with you these resources. Um, so teachers, if these are things that you would like to share with your students, we will share these with you. And this is a really great way to get out in the field and start to learn about some of the organisms that are in your backyard and to take a closer look at the types of soil that you have in your own backyard or community. Ms. Pettit and I think it's really important um, for, excuse me, let me stop sharing here. We and think I it's did really put important. the links. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Pettit. Oh, great, I did Ms. put Pettit. the links in the chat there. box. Oh, great, thanks, Ms. Pettit. Um, we think it's really important for you guys to get out and experience the nature uh, that is in your own backyard and community. We think in order for you to wanna take care of it and appreciate it, um, you have to go experience it. And so we are encouraging you, this is just the starting off point to celebrate World Soil Day. We hope that you guys will take this, go out into the field, have a look around, see what types of things you can find out there and maybe have a little bit more of an appreciation for all the things that our soil organisms do and in turn, all the things that healthy soil does to keep our world a healthy place.